Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. This is our regular weekly message. And today we're starting a brand new series, a brand new two-part series entitled The Vine and the Vine Dresser. This message this morning is entitled The Vine. So turn with me please to John chapter 15 verse 1 through 11. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Each branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. The bottom line in Jesus' discourse is, abide and bear fruit. Bear much fruit, and the more, the merrier. Jesus said that he himself was the vine, and we are the branches. Jesus doesn't just use any old frivolous analogy here to describe his relationship with us and our relationship with him and the father's obligation in the whole plan of fruit bearing. No. I want to describe the vine that Jesus was talking about here for you. The grapevine has a trunk that comes up out of the ground and there on each side are two arms stretching out and they're called canes. It's a perfect picture of the crucified Messiah. Now, from these two arms, several roots grow vertically. Those shoots are the branches who are essentially us, the Christians, the body of Christ. The growing upwards is a perfect picture of our relationship with Jesus. You see, our relationship with them is a vertical one. Our prayers, our intercessions, our requests, they all go upwards. We, we raise our hands in worship. We raise them up. We raise our hands when we're praising, when we're worshiping, when we're singing songs, when we're adoring Jesus. Our relationship is a vertical one. Leaves and grapes only grow from new shoots each year. Therefore, the old shoots are cut off and they're thrown away. This is a very good example of the lesson that we cannot live in yesterday's glory and we cannot survive on yesterday's miracles. God said, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Isaiah 43 verse 19. God does not live in the past and because God is an ever-present God. Therefore, he does not want us to live in the past either. He doesn't expect that. Yes, he wants us to remember the past, remember things that happened in the past for learning purposes, for encouragement but not as a permanent home, not as a permanent hangout. We press on to, 
to what is before us, that we might reach the goal that is ahead of us and not focus on what is behind. So, during the winter, in the downtime, the vine dresser prunes the vine and he chooses four branches as possible kings for the new year, for the new season, two on each side. Then in the spring, before the sap begins to rise, he, he comes back and he chooses two of the best ones, one on each side. The way he chooses is, he looks to see which two are closest to the center of the vine, meaning the ones who are closest to the center of his will. If two branches on one side are desirable, everything is good about them, everything is, is kosher, that, that's exactly what he's looking for, but he only needs one. Therefore, what he does is he looks to see which one is the highest, and he cuts off the highest, and he discards it, and he chooses the lowest. You see, if you're too heavenly minded, you are of, of no earthly good. That does not mean, though, that we should cease from pursuing holiness or cease from chasing after righteousness. But it actually means that we should have a burden for lost souls, that we should care about the orphan and the widow, that we should be the feet, the hands and feet of Jesus here upon the earth. It means that we should be lowly of heart, lowly in spirit, not high and lifted up, not proud and haughty. The next thing is the size of the branch. The branch is inspected and the thinner one is preferred over the thicker one, meaning that God does not want us to get fat and lazy spiritually. We must keep lean and fit it's spiritual by prayer, by intercession, and by praise and worship, by being in the word, by giving our testimony, by reaching the lost and winning souls. He also checks the branches for damage from the frost. The branches with damage are, cho are, are not chosen. They are actually cut off and removed. They're pruned off. You see, it is difficult for God to use people running around with hurt feelings. People who are nursing past wounds that they have received, even if they have received them in a church. It's difficult for God to use you if you can't get past all of the damage. You're like damaged goods. You have to forgive those who have hurt you. You have to put all malice and hard feelings out of your heart, out of your mind. You have, you have to put them behind you. You have to give it over to God so that He can use you, that you might bear fruit. Now in the spring, the same time of the year that Jesus was crucified and died for us, and 50 days later, the Holy Spirit came and indwelt in man. He came and filled us. We were baptized. And that is the same time, springtime, that the sap begins to rise and the king, which is basically the, the, the old branches, become pliable. And the vine dresser carefully and gently ties them down so that new branches can begin to grow and begin to bear fruit. Remember, Jesus told his disciples to tarry in Jerusalem until they were endowed with power from on high. And 10 days after his ascension, they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they, they were to go into all the world and they were to make new disciples. Also, did you notice that they were much more pliable after the infilling of the Holy Spirit? They were love, they were kind, they were forgiven, they were bold and confident, and they bore much fruit. In the same way, 
that life-given sap which represents the Holy Spirit flows up through the vine and into the branches causes those branches to begin to bear leaves and to sprout leaves and to begin to bear fruit. That's the same way that the Holy Spirit fills us so that we might bear fruit. So if you think about it, it's the perfect picture of the Holy Trinity working in us. The vine, which is Jesus. The sap, which is the Holy Spirit. The vine dresser, which is the Father. This is Jesus' last teaching to his disciples. Therefore, it would stand to reason that he would try to give them a cramming lesson on the most important things in life. So let us take a closer look at the crux of Jesus' teaching. Go back with me to verse 4, verse 4 and 5. John chapter 15, verse 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, the mean lesson of, of this teaching is abide. Abide in me and I in you. This word abide is the Greek word miv, which means to remain in place or to tarry. To remain here as opposed to going away. But before you can remain in a place or before you can tarry in a certain place, you have to get to that place. You have to be in that place. Therefore, Jesus was also talking to us Christians. Those of us who believe in him. Those of us who have accepted him as Lord and Savior. Yes, his words were directed towards the, the, his disciples, but his words were also meant for us today. It's, it's to you and to all those who are far off. We Christians cannot produce fruit apart from Jesus, who is the vine. Neither can we have the Holy Spirit, who is the sap. All the nutrients come through the sap, which equates to power. No spirit, no power. That's why so many churches are powerless because they do not have the spirit. What am I talking about? I'm talking about a relationship. I'm talking about a vertical relationship with, first of all, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Second of all, a relationship with His Holy Spirit. Then there is a relationship with the Father who is essentially the vine dresser. And we're going to talk more about the vine dresser next week. But Jesus said that if we establish a relationship with him and we maintain that relationship with him, he will make it worth our while, meaning he will provide benefits. In other words, relationship equals benefits. But don't just take my word for it. I want us to take a look for ourselves. And I want us to read John chapter 15, verse 7, then 9, then 11. So starting with verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. It's all about relationships. Jesus says, if you abide in me and my words in you, that is relationship. Now, listen to me. You cannot and I repeat, you cannot maintain a good and proper relationship without communication. Meaning, 
You have to actively pray. You have to actively seek the Lord. You have to actively praise and worship the Lord. You have to regularly read and study your Bible so that Jesus can speak to you. You cannot hear Jesus. You cannot have a real relationship with Him, with him without these things in place and, and being performed regularly. Now benefits. The benefit is you can ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And then Jesus reiterates the requirement, which is so important. Abide in my love. It's imperative, it's essential, critical that we establish, nurture, and maintain that relationship if we want the benefits, that is. Therefore, if we meet the requirement, then we can have the benefit. The benefit is, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. The word wish is a strong desire, or it's also a long, a longing for, eagerly longing for. Now, I want you to understand that this is not a Christmas list that we just hand over to God and say, Oh Lord, you know how long I've been longing for a Lamborghini. And voila, it'll be parked outside the door in the driveway the next morning. No, it doesn't work like that. I wish it did, but it just doesn't. Because I have a few wish wishes on my wish list as well, but it just doesn't work like that, unfortunately. The next benefit is this, that his joy may be in us and that our joy might be full. That is, to be made complete. Our joy is made complete. It's joy unspeakable and full of glory. It's joy that the world cannot give, nor can it take it away. The joy that the heathen does not recognize, nor can he comprehend it. It's joy in times of trouble. It's joy in times of persecution. It's joy in times of hardship. It's joy in the good times and it's joy in the bad times. Your joy is complete. It's full. Why would Jesus, being God, give us such great and immeasurable promises so with so little requirement? I mean, to access that promise, all we have to do is to stay plugged in. It's the most minimal of requirements. So why would God give away such great promises so cheaply? Well, the answer can be found in the verse we just skipped over. John chapter 15, verse 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Ah, God wants something in return. And so he should. He wants us to bear fruit. And bearing fruit is for our own good, not for God's good, but it brings God glory. It glorifies His name. So it is only fair that we should bear fruit. I mean, Google made billions of dollars by giving away services. YouTube has made billions of dollars by giving away services. And God is glorified when we bear fruit. And we bear fruit when we have such a close relationship with Jesus that we can ask whatever we wish and it will be done for us. What a relationship. What a closeness. Just a closer walk with thee. Grant it, Jesus, is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, Lord. Let it be. But see, the key to that is abide. The word abide appears 10 times in those 11 verses that we read. That tells me that 
It is extremely, extremely important. Matter of fact, I would venture to say that it is impossible to get our heart's desire without continuously abiding in Jesus' love. So how, if, if, if abiding is so important, how do we abide? Well, let us take a look at John chapter 15, verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So did you see it? It was plain right there. The verse said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. So Jesus here is speaking from experience. He kept his Father's commandments and he abide in his Father's love. So if you want to abide in Jesus' love, all you got to do is to keep his commandments. Be obedient. It's better to sacrifice or it's better to obey than to sacrifice. So if you want the benefits, you must adhere to the requirements. You cannot expect to reap where you did not sow. Look at what Joel says in Joel chapter 2 verse 23. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain, as before. The Lord is saying through the prophet Joel, rejoice and be glad. In other words, be grateful and be thankful for what I have given you. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You will have nothing and you will be nothing. We express the love of God through our rejoicing. You see, this word rejoicing, it means to, 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 to beam your countenance. The, the, the Bible tells us that we should so let our light so shine, to let our light so shine that others may see our good works and glorify our Father who is heaven, who is in heaven. We, we are to let our light shine through our face, through the countenance of our face. We're to lift up our countenance because we express the love of God through our rejoicing. Look at these two, two verses with me. There's plenty more that we can look at, but I want us to focus on two verses. First, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 40, then Deuteronomy chapter 12, verse 4 through 7. Leviticus 23, 40. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. Deuteronomy 12, 4 through 7. You shall not worship the Lord your God in that way, but you shall seek the place that the Lord your God will choose out of your tribes to put his name and make his habitation there. There you shall go, there you shall bring your burnt offerings and your sacrifices, your tithes and contributions that you present your vow offerings, your free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herd and of your flocks. And there you shall eat before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. Not just you alone, but you and your household. In all that you undertake, in which the Lord your God has blessed you. God instructs Israel to rejoice in all situations because rejoicing can be considered an offering to the Lord that is connected to the love of God. You cannot, you cannot show the love of God with faces that, that, that are all screwed up, faces that are downcast, faces that, that, that are angry. No, God wants you to rejoice that people may see his love. Because God does not want us to walk around with made up faces and our continents fallen. He wants us to express and show his love because he is the God of love. And he wants us to express that or he expects us to abide in his love. You cannot abide in God's love without rejoicing. 
God uses simple things to convict people of their sins. Simple things. He uses simple things to make them aware of their need for him. So in closing, I want to tell you this story about this loud-voiced, drunken man who was followed by his wife and his small son. He staggered on to a railroad train and, and soon that, that train was running across the lowlands of Scotland. Across the aisle from that drunken man sat a Christian temperance, a worker who felt led to sing an old hymn with the hope that the drunkard would be quiet and perhaps would go to sleep. Soon, that drunkard was fast asleep and began snoring loudly. After a nap of several hours, he awakened and somewhat sobered. As the temperance lecturer left the train, the fellow, that drunkard, held out his hand and bid him goodbye and actually thanked him for singing. Fifteen years passed and a temperance worker was again touring in Scotland. After a particularly successful meeting, a well-dressed young man and his wife came forward and inquired of the speaker if he remembered him. He shook his head, no. He said, why? I'm the man who was drunk that day on the train and you sang me to sleep. But I never could get away from those hymns. And it wasn't long before I was led to Christ. Our son Joseph, who was also with us that day, is now in school preparing for ministry. This Joseph was, in years to come, to be the great Dr. Joseph Parker, who was for a long time pastor in one of London's largest churches. See, something as simple as a song can change lives. God uses simple things. So a smile. All you got to do is to smile. And imagine what that smile could do to somebody else's life. Someone who hasn't seen a smile, who hasn't heard a, a, a good word in days, maybe weeks, maybe even months. But you smile at them and it softens their heart. Just a word. And you know what? They get a feeling of Jesus. When their hearts are melted, when their hearts are softened, Jesus can enter in. It's difficult for Jesus to get into hard hearts. That's why we pray, Lord, soften our hearts. Soften our hearts towards the things of God. Give us soft hearts. Hearts of flesh, not hearts of stone. Hearts of stone is difficult to break through. But a smile can, can break through that, that, uh, that stone of heart, that heart of stone. Because who would have thought that a song could change the life of a drunk and make his, his whole family's life different? Only God. And that's why God instructs us to, to rejoice. It's so important that it's mentioned 154 times in the Old Testament and 74 times in the New the bottom line is this, rejoice and be glad for the Lord our God reigns and he is for us. God is for us and not against us. So let me ask you, is he for you? Do you know him as Lord and Savior? Has he changed your life? If you answered no to these questions, you can. You can change that today. Today's the day of repentance. Tomorrow's promise to no man. So if you would like to know Jesus as your own personal savior, all you have to do is to ask. Here's how. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Lord Jesus, help me to live for you. Help me to rejoice in all situations, under all circumstances, that I might walk around with a smile and not a frown, that my lips would be turned upwards and not, not downwards, that I might look 
to you, that I might maintain that vertical relationship with you, Lord Jesus. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. I accept your free gift of salvation. Apply the blood of Jesus to my life, O oh Lord. And I give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you for your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get your Bible out. Take it off the bookshelf or you don't have to go out and buy one. One that you can read and understand. ESV or one of those. And highlight those verses. Read every single day. Highlight, memorize those, those verses and hide those verses away in your heart that you might not sin against God. Because look, it, it isn't the one who knows or the one who reads, but the one who obeys, the one who puts it all into practice. That's the important thing. Abide in. That's how you abide, by putting it into practice. So here's the other thing I want you to do. Find yourself a Bible-believing church that still believes that thus saith the Lord, that there's a right way and a wrong way, that holiness is the way for us to pursue. Not one of those progressive churches that believes that anything goes and to be a friend of the world is to be the right, is to do the right thing. No, to be a friend of the world is to be at enmity with God. We are to live in the world, yes, but we are to be separate from the world. So find that church. Be discipled in that church. And when, uh, you, you, when Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing what it is that you're supposed to be doing. And he say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now enter in to the joy of the Lord. So I want to say thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate each and every one of you. We love you. The Lord bless you richly. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.